this paper actually emerged from another project that I was doing at Microsoft Research in, uh, in 2012. Um, and I was working with Tim Regan there. And he sort of brought me on to do a project about software engineers and the extent to which they perceive their work as craft. And if you're interested in that, you can check out this paper from CSCW in 2014. And so as we were interviewing these software engineers, um, I noticed and was almost sort of haunted by this, this thing that emerged or rather didn't emerge when I would ask them to list the tools that they used in the course of their work. So if you ask software engineers to describe the work that they do and then you listen to the tools that they mention, they will talk about IDEs and they will talk about whiteboards, they'll talk about notebooks, they'll talk about their hands and their fingertips, they'll talk about other people, um, but they will not talk about computers, right? So they don't actually talk about the computers that are sitting in front of them. And I thought that that was so weird, you know? Like, so I became really interested in the differences between uh, what we think of as being uh, central to a workplace, and yet the tools that become invisible to you the longer you do work. And this is particularly interesting to me in the context of a very sophisticated technological landscape. So on the one hand, I was really interested in that. And then a second provocation for this piece came from a different Microsoft working environment. I was a postdoc at the lab in New England. And I really loved working there. And part of why I, I loved it, uh, there's many reasons. But one reason was I really loved the space. I loved the feeling of being in that lab, right? So here's some photos from that lab. It's a traditional closed office, right? So everybody has these individual closed, closed spaces. Um, and so I have my own little, little office there. You can, you can kind of see it. And uh, at the same time as I was at this lab for two years, I would also go about once a month to the New York lab. So this isn't actually a photo of the New York lab. I couldn't, I couldn't find one, but it, you get the sense. It's an open office layout. All the guys from, from that lab, they all started from Yahoo, so they were used to this sort of like uh, open office space. And I couldn't figure out at first, why did I hate working there so much? I really hated working there. Loved the people, loved the work. The work was the same. Loved New York, lived there for many years, um, but just couldn't stand being in that space. I was always getting in trouble for being too loud, um, and it just really wasn't conducive. And I realized it was the open office layout. And so on the one hand, I was thinking about all these tools that people do and don't mention in their work. And on the other hand, I was thinking about how important our spaces are when we're working. And I was surprised at how much that, that affected me as someone who thinks of herself as fairly agnostic to things like environmental design. So those are sort of these two provocations um, for thinking about work, tools, space, productivity, relationships to technology. So I decided I wanted to research these relationships between people in their workspaces among a group of people who have a deeply material experience of their labor and also a great deal of autonomy over their workspaces. And so the group that came to mind were craftspeople. So with these provocations in mind, I want you to, I, I want to share some of the texts that were particularly important for me in developing this analysis. So first, I was reading Saval's book on workplace architecture, and that sort of provided this historical context for how humans, especially in the United States, have shaped the spaces in which they work. In the paper, I also go into research from environmental psychology on workplace setups, but Saval really gives you um, this sort of history for thinking about why our workspaces look the way they work and sort of what has been the underlying logics for shifting from a closed to an open office space. I'll give a brief plug to Dan Green, who's also been doing some really interesting work on this. Um, yes. And so as far as theoretical frameworks, I take an actor network theory or an ANT view of social phenomena, which means that I see people and technology is embedded in networks with agency distributed throughout, right? So I'm not just interested in how people have some degree of agency and autonomy. I'm also interested in how, how things, how tools, um, how workspaces have a degree of autonomy in the work that takes place there. From the outset of this project, I was also very interested in Fox um, Delgado, Olgado, and um, Daniela Rausner's work on feminist hacker spaces, in which they have this concept of companionability, right? So companionability is this idea that um, the reason these women were drawn to these feminist hacker spaces wasn't just about the work. It was about the work that took place in concert with others, right? The sense of solidarity or silent mutuality that emerged when multiple women are using the same makerspace. So from an ANT standpoint, though, you can look at companionability not just in terms of people, but also in, in terms of people and the tools and the objects that they have surrounding them in their work spaces. So I was interested to see if I could detect this kind of companionability in the workspaces of craftspeople. A qualitative researcher, um, so that meant talking to people. So I found a group of about 14 craftspeople 
Um, as far as how I picked these people, on one hand, I used my personal network. On another hand, I um, recruited through Etsy. I live in Philadelphia, so I set the location to Philadelphia and just saw what shook out. Um, my, I, was, I wanted a broad range of craftspeople, so I have soap makers, tile makers, jewelry makers, woodworkers, um, a florist, a quilter, and I just didn't want hobbyists, right? Like, I wanted people who um, got either some or all of their income from, from doing this work with their hands. And on the other hand, I also wanted people who didn't work in shared spaces. I wanted people who had a lot of control and agency over their space. So those were some of the limits I set on who these people were. Um, otherwise, you can see that they, they vary a lot in, in age, um, and there were 14 of them. In addition to asking them questions about workspaces and the technologies that they used, I also asked them to draw maps of their workspaces. This is my favorite map. It's from a, a, a guy who makes tiles. Um, so I would ask them to do this sort of in real time while they were in front of me. I will admit that um, this tile maker, he was dissatisfied with the map that he made in real time, and then he asked if he could send a new one to me. Um, and so this is the new one that he made with more time. Um, so there's this guy, which is, which is pretty great, and then there's these two maps as well, which are a little bit less, less busy. Um, if you're interested in the maps, they're, they're all part of the um, appendix files um, for, the, for the paper I submitted for this. I don't actually have that much time to talk so much about the maps, but um, if you're interested in participatory mapping as a method, I'm happy to talk more about that. So I want to start off by being clear about emic understandings of technology. And what I mean by that is I'm going to use the word technology throughout the remainder of this talk, and I'm going to use it in the standard STS, science and technology studies way, where we tend to have a very broad understanding of technology, right? Like it isn't just these digital technologies, it's the chairs on which you're sitting, it's the, the doors that open and close. I mean, these are all technologies that we use in our everyday life. And I did have some participants who talked about technology that right way, right? So I had Heather saying, I guess technology Technology is something people develop to make them accomplish a task more easily than if they would just do it themselves. Greg took an expansive view of technology as well. This is technology, and he was waving a pencil. Technology is just something that gives us tools. You'll hear a lot of people say, we make work driven by technology. Yeah, well, everyone's been making work driven by technology. Everything is technology, and everything is handmade. Even if you cut something by hand on a bandsaw, it's still a piece of technology. So those are comments that are very much in line with an STS view of technology, but they were very unusual in, in terms of my perspective participants, and also, frankly, how you hear technology talked about in everyday life, where it tends to be something that means a modem is involved, right? That's sort of the more standard view of what technology is. And that's how most of my participants talked about it. I'd say, how does technology fit into your work? And they would say things like, well, I have a Facebook page for my orders. Or they would say, oh, well, Etsy has made my shop um, so much more efficient or popular. So there's a real divergence. And I point that out first because I think it's important to acknowledge when we as academics use terms that are not used the same way in everyday life. And also because I'll be using, you know, relatedly, I'll be using the word technology to refer to things that my participants would not acknowledge as technology themselves. In terms of how participants talked about setting up their workspaces, they described fitting spaces to their bodies or letting bodies dictate the placement of furniture and tools that they used in their work. So for some participants, space and embodiment was structured mostly around convenience. So Jeff, a glass blower, just said, organization is based on what shelving I own and tools for the primary thing I'm making, how quickly I can reach the raw materials that I need. And when I watched him in his studio, I mean, he, he would turn around, but he didn't have to take a step. I mean, that's how everything in his space was structured so that he didn't have to take any unnecessary steps. For other participants, bodies and in workspaces was tied to safety. So Katrine was particularly descriptive in terms of how her workspace reflected a need to respect and protect her individual body. So she described the height of her table. She was a ceramic artist. She said it was really important, like where you lean over or like how I sit. I've had to make a stool especially for the size of my hips. It's just crazy important to take your own body into consideration. Ceramics is actually a pretty physically demanding task. You're lifting, lifting very heavy um, bags of, of clay or raw material. She was a very slight woman, maybe like 5'3 and 112 pounds, so she was very small. So she had to have a studio that reflected that, that size. So when you take these comments together, you see a very literal and DIY approach to office, office ergonomics. So as opposed to standing desks or office chairs that are intended to support healthy posture while working, craftspeople I interviewed described ad hoc assemblages for situating their workspaces in ways that were really specifically tied to their individual bodies. These efforts enabled smoother, more comfortable workflows in the course of daily productivity, and I see them as a reflection of the autonomy that participants enjoyed when they arranged their own workspaces. 
So another means of individualizing space emerged from participant accounts of their tools and materials provenance. So in a library of science or archival science training, which I'm a former librarian, provenance refers to an object's different um, history. It's different phases of ownership, right? So an object moves from you know, the, the Met to the London Museum to private ownership and back, and that's its provenance. You can trace its history. So unlike most of us, when we think of our, you know, if you're in an office where you get a computer from your IT department, it's washed clean every time it comes from the IT department, and you have no idea where it was before then, right? This is not the case for most participants, especially participants who had very bulky, large, sophisticated uh, machinery. They would sometimes tell these very elaborate, long-standing histories of where their technologies um, had been. So Greg, again, he's a woodworker, conveyed both attachment and a pragmatic detachment from the tools in his workshop. So he says, they all have a story like where they came from. The bandsaw used to make Thomas the Tank Engine, wooden children's toys and yo-yos from the toy factory. They all came from somewhere and served a different purpose at one point in time. Some have had hard lives, some haven't had hard lives. I sell them every once in a while. Their rights in life are pretty limited. Sometimes I modify them. Certain ones are life partners, I call them, where they'll never ever leave. I just restore them. But other ones are a stepping stone in life. I will use them and they will go away. And this quote, Greg, offers many layers of attachment, but also pragmatism, ranging from emotional investment to shrewd instrumentalist detachment. In referring to them as having had lives and rights, he both eleva elevates these tools to sentience and also asserts his own authority over their utility. So this storytelling capacity of workplace technology echoes findings from environmental psychology that notes how workers arranged office artifacts with an awareness that artifacts will convey meaning to others. So some participants were initially reluctant to really get into the history of their tools because they knew I wasn't a woodworker and I wouldn't get it. And then I sort of had to say, oh, I'm a librarian. I really, I really actually care where our objects came from. And then they would open up and sort of tell me these long histories. Librarian, side note number three or four, I was amazed how many people had library catalogs somewhere in their workspaces. So if you've ever wondered, but where have the card catalogs gone? They are apparently hiding out in woodworker shops all throughout the East Coast is what I've noticed. Another theme that emerged from interviews has to do with what I'm calling precarity or making do. Um, I won't go into it too much, but when I say making do, I'm talking in a very Desertonian sense of tactical maneuverings that emerge from improvisation or emerge from a willingness to be flexible. A shared experience among participants involved a continual sense of insecurity and instability. And these um, senses of instability emerged around three key themes. Uh, insecurity of production, insecurity of selling, and insecurity of space. So Katrine, the ceramic artist, um, she emphasizes the first category saying, there's a lot of anxiety and not knowing. Like to have a job where you spend lots of hours working on something and it may or may not turn out. There's no tried and true in this. Things crack all the time. So she's talking about the actual production work being so hit and miss, um, that being a sense of, of precarity. Um, there's another kind of precarity in this same sort of insecurity around production, which has to do with breakage and repair. So many craftspeople I interviewed took it upon themselves and took a lot of pride in knowing how to fix or modify the tools they used in, these work, in this work, work. So Brady says, everything breaks. That was the big impetus for designing my own tools. I use much less stuff that I, didn't, uh, that I didn't design or make. Part of the reason is because when it breaks, I know how to fix it. But then oftentimes when something breaks and I realize some design flaw, I end up redesigning the tool instead of using the tool. Participants expressed a sense of satisfaction of being able to repair their own tools, but this expertise in repair also grew out of a need to mitigate financial insecurity. Participants talked about the precariousness of not being able to predict a steady flow of orders, and they also talked about an instability of space. So many participants described migrating from one studio to another, often with improved homes, improvised home studios in between, typically because of cost and affordability. So Heather described the consequences of these transitions as a process of internalizing instability. She said, you can't necessarily get too attached to a particular space or environment because some, sometimes you're just forced to relocate. I always try to keep that in mind when I'm spending a lot of time in here on this space. You can't fall in love with it too much because you don't own it and you might have to move. So the paradox here is on the one hand, she was investing a great deal of time in customizing workspaces. So all three of these photos are from these sort of kludges that she had pulled together of how to make her very oddly shaped space, um, which was a basement in a warehouse, more uh, suited to her needs. Insecurity as a whole drives a need for improvisation, adaptation, and a certain degree of detachment, which is at odds with the investment of time and effort in customizing their spaces. I'm going to skip flow in the interest of time, but flow, it's, it's very important. 
So I want to get to companionability because that was one of the impetuses for this um, project. So initially, I'd assume that participants would talk about companionability in terms of the tools that they used. And there were people who said that. So one uh, uh, jewelry maker said, oh, man, this squeeze bottle is like my heart. And Katrine, the ceramics artist, was saying, like, oh, if I can't find my little scrubby sponge, I can't work. I need to know where it is at all times. You know, so this real attachment. But there was another kind of companionability that emerged, and it's actually related to flow. And that's the kind of companionability that comes up from having a space that's so well organized that everything is in a everything flows, everything works, and the ultimate degree of productivity and pleasure is met. Um, and so, interestingly, the same metaphor would surface again and again of a symphony or of an orchestra or music, and the idea that companionability isn't just something of an attachment to a tool, but an attachment to a process, where when you have things set up just right, and it's responsive to you and your body and your process, then everything just flows, everything just moves, and you feel like you're a part of a larger process. So Greg says, machines are like an instrument. You have to understand its sensitivities. Right now, my, janers, my joiner's cutting tapers. If I cut on the left-hand side, I won't get a thing called a snipe. The tail stock on my lathe is a couple thousands high right now, so it's certain kind of work. I know that it will do certain things, but it's going to struggle to do other things. So beyond gathering ethnographic accounts of how craftspeople arrange their workspaces and relate to their tools, my aim in this project has been to think about larger paradigms of how people, technology, and space are or could be intertwined. So I've been thinking about this in terms of the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things, you have to understand for the arguments I'm going to make, it's, it's not something that's coming, right? It's something that's already here. So it isn't a question of whether the Internet of Things will emerge, but what technologies and assemblages will be gathered under that name and which ones won't be. So when we think of the Internet of Things, we tend to think about the refrigerator that's connected to your watch and to your cell phone, and it says, hey, you're, you need to get some milk. Um, I think that's a pretty underwhelming. <laughs> I think that's a pretty underwhelming vision of what the Internet of Things could do, and it's a problematic one because it privileges some forms of connectivity over others. So, what happens when we start looking at these craftspeople's narrative of their workspaces to understand the Internet of Things? So, I want to think about policy and design recommendations for the Internet of Things. And I think that narratives of craftspeople offer two key insights. Number one is respecting individual agency, and the second is thinking about materiality. So it's become a degree of comedy for a workplace satire from Dilbert to the office to make fun of how we organize our workspaces. But actually, the socio-technical arrangements that we have are really key indications of how much autonomy we have in the workplace. So go with me for a second on this. Matt Stahl was writing a book about musicians, and he argues that... Um, this is really blew my mind a little bit. So he talks about uh, the contract that you make when you're a worker. And I've always thought of that contract as a matter of um, agency and payment. But he actually says it's about autonomy. It isn't just you spending your time there. It's you saying you will spend your time there doing this thing. So he talks about the lack of agency that you have. I want to make an argument in a very short period of time that the Internet of Things is representative of a paradigm that reduces that autonomy and reduces that agency, and that's really a precarious position to be in. So if we can think about the Internet of Things as a moment that actually isn't seamless, but rather seamful, to quote Michael Weiser, or that allows for moments of breakage and repair, which was so important to craftspeople, that's responsive to individual agency, that's flexible to the arrangements they need to get a certain sense of flow, um, that is a relationship that is not emerging when we talk about the Internet of Things in terms of our, our iWatch and our, and our refrigerator, right? So we need a different vision for what that could be. Um, I'm very influenced by Steve Jackson's work on uh, repair, and I think that the Internet of Things is threatening to be an infrastructure without repair, and that's a real problem. And the second thing that I'll say even more quickly is about the Internet of Things has real and material consequences. Um, and I mean this actually in terms of there are really damaging environmental consequences for um, the paradigm that's represented by the Internet of Things. And when you talk to craftspeople about their work, they're so aware of waste and they're so aware of materiality um, that it wouldn't make sense to them to think about the Internet of Things in an abstract way um, that doesn't have either immediately material consequences or long-term environmental consequences. So I think that that's something we can really learn from craftspeople. So I will stop there. Um, thank you so much.
Yeah. Um, can I tell you I was really just nervous about how to pronounce his last name? I mean, that's like, uh, that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, unsurprisingly, um, anytime people work for themselves, I think they tend to have a, a greater push. There's less cynicism about productivity, right? If you're, if you're cutting your own paychecks, um, the sense of flow isn't like a problem. Although I will say software engineers that I talked to, they also were really into flow. But I think that it's partly about a, the degree of autonomy. But in the paper, flow, um, it emerged from about half the people I interviewed directly using the word flow, and then like another, I don't know, 25% who talked about it indirectly. Um, but it just wasn't really important ethic for how they set up their, their workspaces. But I think that that's particularly important where people have more autonomy. Yes? Hi, Mark Ackerman, Michigan. Great talk. Um, say a little bit more about the autonomy issue. So um, what is it about the Internet of Things that gives a problem for autonomy as opposed to, I don't know, all the things that they have in their workplace now? Yeah, that's a totally fair question. Um, I think what it is for me is um, anytime there's a trade-off between convenience and, say, autonomy or convenience and privacy, I think that that's a, an important trade-off that we need to look at. Um, so the, I'll try and make this argument clear. Um, what I'm saying is when you talk to craftspeople about how they organize their workspaces, they don't have a lot of luxuries, but they have certain luxuries of um, autonomy and flexibility and control over their workspaces. And I think that that represents a kind of agency that is not valued or is overshadowed by an Internet of Things approach to technology. So honestly, for me, it's I'm always interested in individual agency. I'm always interested in how people can maintain a degree of control control over their, their workspaces. Um, but the Internet of Things um, takes away that agency and gives you convenience instead. Um, but all I'll say is Phil Howard's book, Pax Technica, has this really brilliant idea about no device should be able to take your data from you unless it also tells you where that data is going. Like, not about turning it on or off, but you should be able to, it should become more legible. Um, that is a viewpoint that would make a lot of sense to most craftspeople I talk to, but is not something that concerns um, a lot of other workers. Um,